Number five, the castration murders. On the morning of June 14, 1982, the police were called to Daniels Creek in Watosh County, Utah, because a fly fisherman had found a dead body. An autopsy was performed and they concluded that the victim had been shot once in the back of the head and his genitals were missing. Over a year later, the police identified the body as 21-year-old Marty Shook from Truckee, California. Shook was last seen alive two days before his body was discovered when he set off from his mother's home to hitchhike to Colorado. However, even with the identity of the victim, the police had no leads, so they gave the details of the murder to the FBI's National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime. Thanks to the amazing computing technology of the 1980s, the police didn't hear anything back from the FBI until six years later. That's when the FBI said that there was a similar murder committed in Pennsylvania in 1981. 30-year-old Wayne Renfrender from North Carolina was found near Williamsburg in August 1981. The ballistics on the bullets in both cases were compared, and the police determined that both bullets were fired from the same gun. The unidentified serial killer is believed to have killed his third victim in November 1986. That's when the nude body of 26-year-old Jack Andrews from Oklahoma was found wrapped in blankets near a highway restaurant close to Lynchfield, Connecticut. It's impossible to tell how Andrews died, but like the other two victims, his penis was removed. However, Andrew's nipples were also removed and his legs were cut at mid-thigh. None of the missing body parts have ever been found and the identity of the killer behind the castration murders remains a mystery. Number 4. The Texarkana Moonlight Murders Just before midnight on February 22, 1946, 25-year-old Jimmy Hollis and his 19-year-old girlfriend, Mary Jeanne Larry, were parked in the secluded Lover's Lane just outside the twin cities of Texarkana, Texas and Texarkana, Arkansas. Suddenly, a man approached the car and shined a flashlight into their window. The man, who wore a white hood over his head, pointed a gun at the couple and ordered them out of the car. He then had Hollis remove his pants and then he hit Hollis in the head so hard that it cracked his skull. The man then told Larry to run. When she did, he chased her and when he caught her, he raped her. He then let her run away again and she managed to get help. Both Hollis and Larry survived the attack. The second attack happened on March 24, 1946, when 29-year-old Richard Griffin and his 17-year-old girlfriend, Polly Ann Moore, were found shot to death in their car. Like the first couple, they were attacked while they were parked in the lover's lane in the middle of the night. Exactly three weeks later, another couple was attacked while they were parked in a secluded area. This time it was Betty Jo Booker, age 15, and 16-year-old Paul Martin. They had been shot multiple times and their bodies were laying a few miles away from Martin's car. By now, the towns were in a full panic and Texas Rangers were brought in, but this didn't stop the killings. On the night of May 3rd, just before 9pm, 37-year-old Virgil Starks and his 36-year-old wife Katie were sitting in their home when someone fired two shots through a window and into the back of Virgil's head. When Katie went to investigate the sound, she was shot twice in the face. Amazingly, she was able to get up, run away, and get help. She survived the ordeal, but Virgil did not. After shooting the Starks, the Texarkana Moonlight Murders simply came to an end after 10 weeks of terror. In total, the Phantom Killer, as he was called in the media, killed 5 people and injured 3. His identity to this day is a mystery. Number 3. The Toledo Clubber The strange case of the Toledo Clubber started one day in early 1925 with a series of fires. Over the span of several hours, lumber yards around the city of Toledo, Ohio were set on fire. Next, a few weeks later, the city was hit with a series of bomb attacks that targeted homes and tenements, but luckily, no one was killed. The bombings came to an end as suddenly as they started. Supposedly, the arsonist and bomber then began a campaign of brutal assaults targeted at women. He would rape them and then beat them with a club. Accounts vary, but three or four women were killed and another five were injured some of them severely. After the ninth or so attack, the murderer went dormant for a few months, then he re-emerged on October 26, 1925. He raped and murdered a school teacher near her classroom in the early morning, and then later that afternoon, a 47-year-old woman was found raped and beaten to death in her house. Just a month later, on November 23rd, Toledo was again struck by several arson fires that caused $200,000 worth of damage. One of the places targeted was a lumberyard, just like the fires that started off the strange crime spree. 
The police and the media speculated that one person was responsible for all of the arsons, the bombings, and the rapes and murders. However, it's unclear if they are connected at all, and it is possible that the police used the theory of one person committing all the crimes to bootstrap a bunch of unsolved cases together. Number 2. The Zodiac On the night of December 20th, 1968, 17-year-old David Faraday and his 16-year-old girlfriend, Betty Lou Jensen, were found shot to death in a gravel pit near Villaggio, California. The crime was motiveless, and the police were baffled. Little did they know, but this would be the first known murders in one of the most infamous unsolved serial murder cases in American history. The next murder was committed on July 5th, 1969. Another young couple was shot in their car in a remote area not far from the first murder. This time, 22-year-old Darlene Farron was killed, and her boyfriend, 19-year-old Mike Magoo, was shot, but he survived. Magoo described the shooter as a white man, 5'8", 5'9", late 20s to early 30s, stocky build, round face, and brown hair. An hour after the shooting, an unidentified man called the police and told them the location of the shooting, and he took credit for the murders of Faraday and Jensen. Weeks after Farron's murder, the San Francisco Chronicle received a letter and a coded message from the killer who signed off the note with the same symbol used on Zodiac watches. A week later, the San Francisco Examiner got a letter from the killer. This time he identified himself as the Zodiac. On September 27, 1969, a couple sitting on a beach was approached by a man wearing a black mask with the Zodiac symbol on it. 22-year-old Cecilia Shepard was killed in the attack, but her 20-year-old boyfriend survived. The Zodiac's fifth and final confirmed victim was 29-year-old cab driver Paul Stein. Like many of the other Zodiac victims, Stein was shot with a 9mm. A piece of his bloody clothing was sent to the press along with a letter from the Zodiac taking credit for the murder. The Zodiac stands out among other serial killers because he taunted the police for years but was never identified. He sent multiple letters to the police and the media all the way into the 1970s after the killings had stopped. The letters included four ciphers three of which have never been officially solved. The prime suspect is Arthur Lee Allen, a teacher and janitor who lived in the area. However, Allen's DNA did not match the DNA on the back of the stamps used by the Zodiac. He passed away in 1991, so we may never know if he was responsible or not. Number 1. The Original Night Stalker Not to be confused with Richard Ramirez, who was labeled the Night Stalker, the original Night Stalker terrorized Southern California between 1979 and 1986, and he was never caught. The original Night Stalker, who we will now refer to as the ONS, was described as an athletic man in his 20s that wore a mask and he would break into the houses where he knew women lived. If the woman had a partner living with her, the ONS would attack both of them while they slept. He would tie them both up with twine, and then the woman would be raped while the partner was forced to watch. He would tie up both victims with twine, and then the woman would be raped while her partner was forced to watch. The ONS was also known to play sadistic games with his victims to ensure that the men watched the assault on their girlfriends and wives. After the sexual assault, in most cases, the victims would be beaten to death. In total, at least 10 people were killed by the ONS. The ONS left a few clues behind at his crime scenes, notably he left his DNA. When it was tested in 2001, investigators made a shocking discovery. The DNA was linked to a prolific serial rapist called the East Bay Rapist. Between 1976 and just before the ONS murder started in 1979, the East Bay Rapist had raped at least 40 women. However, the DNA testing did not turn up a suspect. Another clue in the ONS murders is a recording of the killer's voice that comes from an answering machine of one of his victims. The ONS had a tendency to call his victims before and after the attacks. He would call before to make sure his potential victims were home. He would ask for someone who didn't live at the house so the victim would dismiss it as a wrong number. He also called at least one of his victims after raping her and he left this threatening message. Police are still hoping they will discover the identity of the original Night Stalker, who would be in his 60s if he was alive today. 
Thanks for watching Criminally Listed. If you like what you saw, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe. We post a new video every Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thanks again for watching.